Uh, the last time we had a webinar, which was about a month ago in March, we talked about the challenge from low-cost rivals and some of the reasons why this challenge has become a lot more serious in the last 10 years or so. Today we're sort of going to turn the tables a little bit and focus more on what are the strategies that one can, a company can use or a business can use to try to beat its low-cost competitors or at least challenge them in their, in their space. So before we really get into looking at the options, I think a good way to frame the discussion is to go back to some basics uh, and put good enough or low-cost competition in, in perspective. If we think about the value propositions that we can offer to our customers, they really have three core elements. First of all, we can offer our customers performance value, where what we try to do is we try to win with our customers by offering superior functionality, innovative features, exceptional quality, and if appropriate, fashion or style leadership. I think uh, maybe if I said consumer electronics maybe 10 years ago, the name that would have come to many of your minds would have been Sony. Today, if I probably say consumer electronics and performance value, probably many of you will say Apple, although perhaps at the moment it's tottering a little bit on its, uh, on its perch as the, the leader in that, in that space. So a company that really, if we talked about, for example, environmentally friendly cars in the last four or five years, probably many of you would have said Toyota, which has really gotten a lot of the whole Prius has really helped uh, position it as a leader in performance value in terms of environmental friendliness. So when we talk about performance value leadership, we want our customers to say they're always at the leading edge. Apple is creative and constantly stays ahead of their competitors. So that's really performance value. The second way of competing, of course, is based on price value where what we offer our customers is best price for a standard offering, where it's more about good enough quality, performance, and style. So the gay in, uh, in retailing, and many people might think of Walmart as a company that, that fits that sort of bill. An example we used from Europe in the last webinar in the, in the low-cost airline business was Ryanair which offers substantially lower prices than any other airline in Europe and uh, yet provides good enough quality performance and so on. And best on time performance, uh, fewer, fewest canceled price, uh, the lowest amount of lost luggage and so on. And so when a company is playing that kind of game, what we want our customers to say, you always get a great deal, you can't beat their prices, they provide trouble-free basic service. The third uh, core value proposition so is more about uh, is about um, is about relational value. Where there will we offer our customers is customized treatment, tailored offerings, complete and integrated solutions, if appropriate, convenient, rapid response. And these, this kind of relational value, value proposition is almost always based very heavily on mutual trust. So there a good example might be private banking, where we, what we would want with a private banker, of course, is they provide a very customized solution to our particular needs. Uh, so, and what we would like our customers to say, of course, is that it's very much about they really understand my business and issues, they provide exactly what I need. I consider them to be a close business partner. Other companies that might fit in that, uh, in that uh, relational value would be, certainly since its early days, uh, Cisco really focused a lot on relational value. Uh, General Electric in many of its businesses. IBM Global Services would be another one. So that's all about those three core value propositions. Now, clearly, as a customer, what we would like is we want all three. Really, we want the best performing products at the lowest possible price with a nice, warm, uh, customized relationship with our supplier. But most of us, of course, are realistic enough to realize that we have to make trade-offs and we have to have 
some priorities. And of course, and as a company, what we tend to do, or a business unit within a company more correctly, we will probably, for a particular period of time, we will tend to focus on one of those value propositions as being the key focus of our efforts, and then more try to satisfy, satisfy some of the other ones. So if we're play, playing a performance value game, yes, we may have some flexibility in terms of price, but, but I, I put there parity, that we've got to be in the ballpark in terms of price. We've got to be in the ballpark at a particular point in time in terms of relational value. And, of course, if we want to be the leader, then we have to be well above parity. In, for example, if we're trying to be a performance value leader, well above the parity in terms of what our competitors are offering in terms of performance in terms of performance value. So, and of course, what we see is that parity tends to improve over time. Performance in a particular product or service category tends to get better over time. Prices in real terms tend to fall. The relational value tends to improve, often these days mediated by technology and customer relation management systems and so on, who can help provide better relational value often at uh, Lower, at lower costs. Now, that's a fairly static view of these core value propositions. If we take a more dynamic perspective on them, then uh, if we take a look at uh, the introductory stage of a new product life cycle, uh, sorry, of a new product life cycle, say of a new product category, let's think about mobile phones in the late 80s or laptop computers in the late 80s. Um, then in the early days, in the introductory stage of a product life cycle, most customers are initially very, very whole focused on performance value. Um, why? Well, initially, performance often isn't very good. For those of you that can remember back to the early days of laptop computers or mobile phones, they weren't very, very good initially. Mobile phones were heavy. They had poor battery life. The radio and aerials weren't very good. Calls were dropped frequently. The screens were hard to read, and so on. And, of course, over time, they improved. So most customers waited fairly eagerly for the next generation of the product, the next year's new mobile phone or laptop computer, because there was a significant improvement in performance. Of course, there are always going to be a few customers that even at the introductory stage are very focused on price, and they will buy a, a cheap a brick mobile phone, if you like, as long as it's cheap enough. And depending, of course, on the product category, there may be some uh, some customers that really want somebody uh, that will provide them a, a nice, tight relationship, will cater to their needs, even though their products may not be the best in the market space. Then over time, of course, as a, as a product category moves towards maturity, goes through the growth stage and moves towards maturity, a couple of things start to happen. First of all, the performance gets steadily improves over time. Initially, the performance improvements are large and very noticeable, but over time, the increments get smaller and smaller, and often from, from the point of view of the suppliers, the cost of getting these incremental improvements may rise, and in some businesses may even rise exponentially. There's still a lot of improve opportunity often for cost reduction, so price value tends to improve, and of course relational value also often tends to improve over time. Then what we often see happening is at some point during this evolution of performance value, some customers, perhaps new customers that have just entered the market, sort of say, hey, the performance today is good enough. I don't need the latest and greatest. I don't need to wait for the latest um, Apple smartphone or whatever the product category happens to be. What I'm going to look for is something with good enough performance at a very good price, or if appropriate, somebody that provide, has good, very good performing products, maybe not the best, but really will work very, very closely with me and will look after my every need. And so what we see over time is we see the share of the total market that is goes to 
companies or products that are focused on performance leadership versus price value or relational value tends to shrink. There's nothing magic about the size of these different bubbles, but the point is that, that generally over time, a smaller percentage of the overall customers in the market are looking for leading the, the absolutely the latest and greatest performance. And there is a bigger and bigger group that either want price value or relational value. Again, depending a lot on the particular um, characteristics of the product or service category. We're probably starting to see this certainly move in this direction now in the smartphone space. Maybe not so much in North America or Western Europe, but now there's very, very clearly a segment particularly in emerging markets like India and China and Indonesia and Latin America, where there's a significant number of customers who want their smartphone, but they don't want the latest and greatest. They're happy getting a very good smartphone or a good enough smartphone at a reasonable price. So we're probably going to see a lot of growth in the smartphone business actually care not at the very, the, the most leading performance end of the market, but rather good enough products at very attractive prices. We've sort of seen this develop very rapidly in countries like India, for example, at the current time. So, so that's what we sort of see. And, of course, this cycle seems to be happening more and more quickly in many industries. We go from introduction to growth to maturity in very, very short periods of time. One might, re you know, for those of you that are old enough and remember TVs before LCDs when we had cathode ray tubes, uh, Sony with the Trinitron technology kept a performance leadership edge for many, many years in that business. But when we came to LCD technology, that industry very rapidly moved to commoditization in a very, very short period of time. So the price value of the segment of the market became very big very quickly. And so the very soon there was a big and large good enough segment of the market. And I think we're seeing that happen with more and more speed in many, many industries uh, today. So another way of looking at it, if, that, if you'd like, with this uh, diagram sort of suggests that as we move over time, you know, in the early stages, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the a big percentage of the overall market is focused on performance value, performance leadership products, but over time it moves towards price value, relational value, and performance value tends to shrink. And of course what we've seen in some industries in Silicon Valley is that a lot of companies don't perhaps anticipate this trend and continue to pay, pay a performance value gain as that becomes of interest to fewer and fewer uh, customers in the market, at least a, a smaller and smaller percentage of the customers in the market. Given if you think back over the last couple of decades to engineering workstations, you know, and we saw companies like Silicon Graphics, who were a very significant player when it was a performance value gain, but really didn't adjust as the world moved on, and ultimately I think uh, Silicon Graphics and some other players went bankrupt or dropped out of the business. So as we, uh, we face this commoditization of the market, and more and more customers start responding to good enough products that are often provided, of course, by low-cost competitors or price-value competitors. There's a traditional premium player that perhaps started out emphasizing performance value. We have really three options for responding to the low-cost competition. First option, of course, is to try to respond by moving into the lower tiers of the market and challenging the low-cost competitors directly with our own uh, price value or good enough products and services. The second option is just to keep doing what we've always done, is to try to distance our business from the price value, the low-cost competitors, by continuing to increase performance value. And the third option, of course, is to try to distance our business from the low-cost competitors by increasing relational value, by building tight and intimate relationships with our customers so that a significant percentage of the customers in the market will choose to do business with us rather than somebody offering good enough products at a low price. 
Well, of course, realistically, what most of us do, most companies do, is use a combination of these op- options. So if we've been playing a performance leadership game, what we might do is we might do uh, continue to do option two plus option one, or we may even do um, move more towards option three and do option one as well. So there are various combinations, of course, that we can choose. Some companies that historically um, did not play the price value game have decided they have to do it aggressively in most of their businesses. A good example, a recent good example of a company recently uh, being very public about uh, this this strategic direction is taking is General Electric. As uh, in a conversation Jeff Immelt had with the Financial Times, uh, he talked about in the past that General Electric had aimed to produce only quality, expensive, high-end products to sell around the world. But that strategy, Jeff Immelt said, is changing in nearly every product from wind turbines to medical scanners. Now I want to occupy every corner of an industry. I want to have the value product all the way up to the high-end product, Immelt said. We don't want to give any space to a competitor from places like China and India. So his fear, of course, is letting, and he uses China and India as examples, but it certainly doesn't have to just be there, letting a competitor from one of those uh, countries get established very, very strongly in the good enough segment of the market and using that as a base over time to move up market into the premium segments of the market. And we talked last last month about some examples of that. Companies like Huawei that have risen from good enough products in the Chinese market to now being probably the world's largest supplier of telecommunications equipment, including premium products at the very high end or the highest end of the industry. So the first option then is essentially, again, I'm using the, 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 the triangle that we used in the, in the first webinar, is where we decide to move into lower tiers of the market and challenge those low-cost competitors directly, either through organic growth or through acquisition, and we'll come back to that in a minute. I don't, we don't really have time, and I don't want to go into much detail, but there are a lot of arguments that we can make about why that might be a good idea. First of all, in many, many businesses, there's a real market need for good enough products. As we talked about earlier, over time, a growing proportion of customers in many markets seek good enough products at low, attractive prices. So a second advantage to, uh, to moving directly into the lower tier of the market, of course, it gives us an opportunity to build relationships with customers, customers who today are buying good enough products, but perhaps either in a business-to-consumer or business-to-business market over time might seek to buy premium products. Again, a good example might be in China or India where we're dealing with, <clears throat> we're selling our, in a business-to-business world, selling our products to uh, companies that are competing in the de- domestic market in China. They themselves are making good enough products or services. They are buying good enough maybe equipment for them, their manufacturing operations and so on. But perhaps at some point they might decide to go outside of China into Western Europe and, and uh, North America, for example. And then they may want to have a, a product uh, that meets international standards. For example, in the, in the um, power generation business with um, gensets. Uh, for example, a Chinese company... Uh, moving into Europe or North America might want to have an engine from Cummins or Caterpillar or somebody like that that can be serviced anywhere in the world where spare parts availability and 24-hour service is available. So in China, they might have been quite happy buying a good enough product from a local supplier, but now as they go global, they want to buy a product uh, that is uh, service and spare parts availability around the world. So that's what we mean about building relationships with customers, that when they decide to have a need for a premium product, they've been happy with our good enough product, they look to us for a premium product. Another reason, of course, is often it's an opportunity to gain economies of scale because many of the parts, subsystems, 
in a good enough product and the premium product might be shared. It also, if we have a strong sales or distribution organization, it may create sell-up opportunities. Customers are attracted to our good enough product, but a, a salesperson might be able to say, for this application, you really need our premium product for this, this, and this reason, and give some justification, and they buy the premium product. Of course, it helps control the low-end competition because now we're competing with them in their space rather than waiting for them to come into the premium market and challenge us in our space. And, of course, in some businesses, we may feel if we don't go down into the market, into the good enough segment of the market, we are ultimately, as the good enough competitors move up, we may be actually driven out of the top of the market. Of course, it's not just advantages, there are disadvantages. There's the potential cannibalization of our high-end products with perhaps particularly attractive market margins by a good enough product with less, with lower margins. But, of course, the argument against that is if we don't do it, somebody else will. And so the great margin we, ex we are experiencing in today will be zero margin in the future if a competitor takes that business away from us. It may, of course, damage the brand image. The good enough products may not be of the same performance, the same quality levels that our traditional products. And, of course, some companies deal with that with a sub-branding strategy. And, of course, another significant disadvantage is that just we lose focus on our core business. We're now trying to compete in two very different different markets, and we may perhaps end up with a, a confused business model. But as we know, there are lots of companies that have made this move, some of them very successfully, some of them less successfully. A fairly successful one would, <coughs> I'm not going to talk about all these examples, would be Dow Corning, which is the world's largest supplier of silicon, which has a, a, a sub-brand called Zyamida, which basically um, is an online business model that sells a limited range of products, um, at lower prices for the customers that are willing to buy in larger quantities, don't require the same level of service, will adhere to very strict business rules, and so on. We have a company like Nestle, a B2C example, that today is selling good enough products in many of the world's emerging markets as it tries to build a Nestle brand uh, with customers um, uh, even in remote rural areas and villages and so on. So they have an affiliation with Nestle before they move to the cities where they then will maybe be thinking about private label brands from Walmart or Carrefour or Tesco or somebody like that. Clearly, software companies like Adobe and Intuit have good enough products that uh, Adobe, the Photoshop elements and intuitive basic versions of it into its uh, Quick and QuickBooks uh, TurboTax would be examples of that, and so on. There's some examples there. General Electric, we talked about Vestas, which is the has been uh, the performance leader, if we would like, in the wind turbine business. Has tried to, not so successfully, try to move into the good enough wind turbine market in uh, China. ABB, Danfoss, Coney, Marriott, and so on. As I mentioned, some of these companies have. Um, done it through acquisition. Uh, this is a company called Danfoss, which makes uh, frequency uh, converters for applications like um, uh, production lines, cranes, things like that. And it chose to move into the good enough segment of the market by acquiring a low-cost uh, Chinese good enough player in a local market in China and then essentially using a sub-branding strategy. Um, you will be able to see on this, uh, on the, if you could dig into this website, that this is a, a business unit of, uh, of Danfoss. It also today manufactures Danfoss branded products for the, the parent uh, company. A company that chose a different route is ABB and Process Automation. Again, this is its operation in China. It's a company called WinNation. And it has tried to build a Chinese company organically from scratch. Um, so just a, a totally greenfield Chinese uh, company. Um, 
in the process automation business where ABB is the global is the global market leader. And this has been a very interesting journey for them, a journey that they are still on. Is, and of course, if it works for them, this is something likely they will duplicate in other parts of the ABB uh, business. But there are huge challenges in both doing the HOLOP, uh, the acquisition of a low-cost competitor, and then, of course, the greenfield or the organic route that ABB has taken. And a lot of it is a really around mindset. It's a, it's very it's a very different requires a very different mindset to succeed in a good enough segment of the market than it than it does to succeed in the uh, uh, performance leadership game or even with the relational value game. So those are those are it's a couple of examples of some examples of companies pursuing option one. Option two is where we continue to basically play the performance leadership game, but what we try to do is distance our business from low-cost competitors by increasing performance value. What we try to do is develop products and services that are superior to those of lower-priced competitors in terms of functionality, quality, performance, or style. So we talked a bit about Apple. We talked about Toyota. Intel would be an excellent example of, the, of a company that has tried to, uh, uh, to try to do this in its primary business. Although you could say uh, Intel has also pursued option one in its early days with its Celeron uh, processes. Another good one would be SML, the company that makes the lithography systems for companies like in, Intel and Samsung and TSMC and so on. And of course, we have some familiar examples even in the B2, uh, B2C space. Uh, Gillette, Procter, was now part of Procter & Gamble, has been successful in increasing performance value over time. You know, it started off with track two blades in 1971 with a two blade razor. And then, um, good news, it's disposable two blade in, in 1976. And of course, today, it's got the food fusion and so with five blades and, and so on. And one wonders how many blades can you ultimately get? Can you keep playing this game? But so far, P&G has done this quite successfully and, and the razor blade business, the razor business continues to be a profitable one for Procter and Gamble. One of the issues, of course, is it's increasingly a challenge to get a good return on investment by improving performance value in many industries. Um, as we talked about, we talked about uh, quite a bit in the webinar in March, competitors copy us so much more quickly than they did 10 or 20 years ago. And there's a lot of reasons for this, some of which we talked about in March. So we make this big investment in R&D, but we find uh, it's very difficult to get a good return on the investment before it's copied and we're having to slash prices to... Uh, to uh, hold on to market share and, and, and so on. And to increase performance value in useful ways really requires a deep uh, understanding of customer needs. We have to, you think, you know, really understand customers to know what will create real customer value that customers be willing to pay a significant premium for. Again, maybe 20 years ago, if we're in a high-tech business, we try to outspec the competitors and maybe not always certain which things that we were doing would really actually provide value to customers, which wouldn't. So we just try to outspec them and hope that some of this would, would stick. Clearly today there are penalties in that in terms of cost and time and so on. So we can't afford to do that anymore. So today we have to be really, really focused on only truly increasing performance value in areas we really feel that customers will be willing to pay a premium for. And of course, particularly into business to business market, more and more our customers are looking for proof that improved performance value will lead to improved financial results from them. They say, yeah, I sort of agree that you're doing some really neat things here, but show me how it's going to impact my bottom line. And we are seeing some companies that are doing a pretty good job on that. Really good example of that, I think, is SKF that some of you will know is perhaps the world's largest, SKF is the largest bearing uh, manufacturer in the world, making everything bearings from tiny little micro bearings to the bearings on uh, on massive wind turbines and things of that sort. 
And uh, clearly, SKF historically competed, competed by producing the very best bearings in the industry and charging premium prices for them. But again, like many of you, its customers are really asking, uh, what have you really done for me recently uh, that will impact my bottom line? So it has something called its Documented Solutions Program. And what it's developed over the last 10, 15 years is a database containing almost 20,000 case studies of SKF products in use where end user investments and benefits have been identified, quantified, measured, and tracked. Each case study captures the application of the bearing, the benefits the customer received, reduced failure rate, longer life, savings in labor materials, inventory, etc., the investments the customer had to make to get those benefits. For example, the premium paid for the SKF bearings, perhaps additional tools they had to buy, or add in services, add on services they needed, uh, such as condition monitoring services and things of like uh, that sort. But with this database and a software tool, then SKF can calculate the expected savings and ROI for a customer from choosing the SKF solution over a competitive offering. And incidentally, each of these 20,000 case studies, the customer has signed off on and said, yes, I used the SKF solution, and these are the benefits I received, this is the value of the benefits I received, and these are the investments I had to make to get those benefits. So the case studies look something like, uh, like this. You know, this is an example from a petrochemical refinery, pump population of over 500, uh, SKF promises it can reduce bear, in, increase the mean time between failures from 18 months to 54 months. So in that 54 month pe period, reducing the number of failures of pumps by 1,046. The cost of a fail, those failures is about 12.5 million in components and about 1.2 million in labor to, uh, to uh, fix the pump. So the total cost of the of the failures to the customer would have been 13.7 million. The investment in the SKF solution would have been, uh, cost the customer 2.3 million. So the net benefit is 11.4 million, giving an, uh, the SKF solution providing an ROI of 500%. So this kind of data is pretty convincing to many customers since it's based on custom, customer data, signed off customer data. And SKF will even in, in many cases guarantee a portion of the ROI. Clearly in this case it wouldn't guarantee 500%, but it might guarantee the customer 100% return on investment if they follow the SKF solution. So this is pretty convincing to many customers and gives them a good reason to buy the SKF solution over a much cheaper Chinese uh, solution. Now to do this hasn't been an easy task. Getting those 20,000 case studies has been a very, very big task, of course, for SKF to pull those together. To really to build the expertise to provide these solutions has had to make a whole series of, of uh, acquisitions over the last few years. Um, it wasn't very good at making acquisitions initially, so it had to learn how to successfully integrate acquisitions and so on. But today, in many of the businesses it serves, it really is the expert. And uh, customers value its expertise in many, many areas that goes well beyond just supplying the bearing. The third option, of course, is to try and distance our business from low-cost competitors by increasing relational value. Here we try to build tight intimate relationships with customers that make the business less vulnerable to low-cost competitors. I'll put a few examples here. One we'll talk about is Orica. But Procter & Gamble, in a business-to-business -business sense, this does it with its, uh, its customers like Safeway and Kroger and Walmart and Tesco and so on. GE does it in many businesses. IBM Global Services, Cisco. Tesco does it on a more mass basis with its... Um, with its individual uh, consumers and its supermarkets in the countries it operates uh, in. So many of these companies, again, ban began by stressing performance value. So let's look at one example of this, Orica. Orica is actually, was originally part of ICI, the UK company, and one of the, and it made 
explosives for, among other things, blasting in rocks and quarries. Historically, RCI explosives made better explosives than some of its competitors, but over time it became commoditized and a price game. At that point, Oracle realized, of course, what its customers want is not explosives. What they would like to have is rock on the ground that meets their size specifications. A customer might only want rock on the ground that perhaps varies between half an inch in diameter and six inches in diameter. If it's too much bigger than that, it has to go through a, a, either a, a blasting, a secondary blasting operation, or a, go through a particular kind of crusher. If it's too small, it may be too small to process, it's not valuable to the customer. So what Orica did is it took all, it started to provide blasting services for its customers. So it offered to take over the blasting activity from its customers, do the blasting in the quarries and the mines. In most cases, it would begin with a three or six month trial using the customer's own equipment and blasting crews. If the trial is successful or was successful, Orica and the customer would sign a long-term contract and the staff and the equipment typically would become Orica's responsibility. And a key thing was the customers paid Orica for not for the blasting, but for the rock on the quarry floor or at the mine floor that met their side specifications, a certain numbers of dollars per ton. Now, of course, when Orica is doing these blasting solutions, it's doing it for quarries and mines around the world. It's built some very, very sophisticated models to help it do the blasting. So based on things like temperature, rock conditions, uh, obviously the customer requirements in terms of size and so on, the blasting patterns where it will put, how much of a explosive it will put in each, in, each of the, uh, in each of the blasting holes, the timing, the sequencing of the, bla of the blasts and so on. It can, it's been, become much better at doing a blast so more of the rock meets the size specification of the customer. There's less wastage, there's less dust, there's less need some secondary processing. So what it has done is created value that customers are willing to pay for. Some of this uh, value created goes to uh, the customer, and but of course a lot of it is kept by Orica itself. So now it's gone from a commodity business of blasting explosives to basis whether to a business where there are huge barriers to entry for a good enough competitor trying to break into this market. With these very, very sophisticated models, uh, it has developed a core capability that uh, competitors have difficulty matching. So what we've seen today, there are, there are three major options that companies have for um, responding to uh, low cost or good enough competitors. One is to, um, is to uh, move into the good enough space ourselves, perhaps staying also obviously in our core premium business. The second one is just to stay in the, in the performance leadership game, which is where most companies typically start, um, and then but try to find a way to stay ahead of them, the competitors as SKF did, or as Orica did, offer this rock on ground service, which is what they call their blasting service, to customers who uh, value and are willing to pay for a company willing to pay to provide uh, very integrated solutions and a service for the customer. So if we had to summarize that low-cost competition is a big and growing challenge for many leading companies, and I'm sure for many of you uh, that are listening to this uh, webinar, it won't go away, and you have to respond to it. And because what we're seeing, of course, there are customers, including many of you in either your business or private lines. You're looking for good enough solutions that are attractively priced. This is pretty inevitable. inevitable. The products and services become more and more commoditized over time. Low-cost competitors and banks emphasizing this price value emerge to service these markets. Over time, they can threaten the premium brands in the market and, and you shouldn't be attempted really to ignore the threat because of few initial losses to the low-cost competitors. Because as we talked about last, last time with companies like Huawei, the momentum builds very, very rapidly and it, become, it can become unstoppable. 
But what we've talked about today is you do have options for how to respond to the low-cost threat. Meeting the challenge requires some very, very tough choices, but the earlier companies make the tough choices, the better will be that position in the longer run. So when you talk to people that have faced this challenge and try to deal with it, almost always when you say, what would you have done differently, almost always this, the response is, we should have moved much, much faster than we actually did. Well, thank you for listening. Maybe we have time now for turn it back over to Ryan, and maybe we'll have time for a few Q&A, few questions. How would you compare Intel and Apple? where both have distinct advantages for the high end and, struggling, and are struggling to get into the low end market. How does the global economy play into this view? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. I mean, I, I think we'll maybe find out a bit today, later today, when the Intel uh, quarterly announcement and conference call and so on about Intel has obviously been struggling a little bit against ARM um, holdings in the, in the mobile space. Um, and so we're seeing a company that uh, fairly successfully with the uh, PC processor with the Celeron helped um, help certainly help it uh, compete uh, against um, a number of low-cost offerings in the personal uh, computer space, helped it to get into there and, and compete more effectively in that segment of the market against AMD and VIA and, and so on. Um, yes, it's, it's difficult. When you look at both um, Apple and Intel, uh, they both have challenges. And um, Intel clearly uh, has a lot of technology going for it. So that's an area where there's still some performance leadership opportunities, I think, as it, sh it shrinks the, the, um, the feature size on, on, its, on its chips and so on. It has an opportunity through... Uh, through technology, I think, to compete uh, with ARM holdings in terms of power and things like that. Apple is a very interesting one. It's a, it's, uh, although it's been preparing a performance leadership game, I argue that it also has prepared, been preparing for the day that performance leadership advantage is gone. And by that I mean it's the things like iTunes, the retail stores, um, uh, it's really doing, been doing a, quite a good job of building relational value with its, uh, with its end users. So I think it is not just dependent on products anymore. It is building some fairly tight and intimate relationships with customers that will be hard for low cost, for example, Chinese players to disrupt. Doesn't mean they won't take a lot of share away from Apple, but Apple I think has been doing a pretty good job. Um, uh, so far of, of transitioning, preparing for the day when performance, it's very difficult for it to maintain a performance leadership position. Thank you. All right. Our next, and, and, you know, I'm going to say thank you for everyone who submitted a question. We likely will not have time to answer them all uh, here during the webinar. Hopefully we can get you answers after. Our next question is going to is, um, how easy is it for a company that has been playing a performance leadership game to serve customers who want good enough products at low prices. Yeah, it, it, that that is a real a real challenge, um, uh, and we've seen lots of failures. You know, you can think about all of the the European and North American airlines that have tried to cheap with, to compete with the low cost competitors uh, very uh, unsuccessfully at this point. The, the issue is often it, it's not just about the product or the packaging; it's about um, having a dram often a dramatically lower cost structure, fixed cost structure in particular. And I think that's what uh, Western companies see when they go to China. It's not so much the variable costs of these competitors they have trouble dealing with. It's the dramatically lower fixed cost structure. Another thing, and part of that is also often it may need a very different route to market to meet, to, to, to get to the good enough customers in the market, particularly if the customers are, for example, in developing markets like China and India, it may be getting away from the coast, or from the tier one and tier two cities in China, getting to the tier three and tier four in the rural areas, and so on. So it re requires a very different go-to-market strate market strategy than we have typically adopted. And this is a big, big challenge in both B2B and B2C space for uh, companies doing it. It's a, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a lot about mindset. Let me just give you one quick example of that. 
I mentioned the ABB example in process automation with Winmation. Uh, I won't go into the whole story about building this uh, company from scratch, but, but one of the things they did was they put a small team together to build the company, and they got a, a, an old bicycle factory as their first factory that needed, obviously, totally uh, re-equipping as an office and uh, factory for Winmation. And one of the things they did, of course, was they, they got bids from some their traditional ABB suppliers to, to refit the, uh, the offices and the factory and so on. And they got from some more traditional Chinese players. And the Chinese bids were dramatically lower than the ABB, the traditional ABB supplier. And one of the interesting things was just a, just an example was the carpet. The carpet that the Chinese uh, supplier was offering had a three year life. And the traditional ABB person, the company that would normally outfit their offices, was offering carpet with a 15 to 20 year life. So they went to the Chinese uh, supplier and said, why are you offering carpet with only a three year life? It, um, and the Chinese supplier said, look, if you're successful, you'll have vastly outgrown this building in three years and the building, you'll be looking for a new building, three years is good enough. If you're not successful, you'll have closed the business down and you won't need it anyway. So three-year life is actually, carpet is actually perfect for you. So that's what I mean about the mindset. It's very difficult to go from a, a high-performance uh, leadership mindset to to really think like a low-cost competitor. There are some good examples of companies that have done it successfully, but it almost always needs a separate business unit with a separate management team and so on. It's a huge, huge challenge. So it's not about just about physical product and so on. It's about the total mindset that one needs. Back to you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Well, that actually brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, if I, so uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to pre present some of the questions that we had again in the queue to Professor Ryan's um, and have, an have hopefully an opportunity for him to send you maybe a short answer. Of course, you're always welcome and, and encouraged to, to come to the Executive Institute and, and, and talk to him personally. Uh, at this time, again, I want to thank uh, the professor uh, and our attendees, uh, and this ends our webinar today.